Get in the pits of metal chaos with Tanya as she interviews the best of metal from around the world to the gates of hell and back. Now kneel down and show respect for the true creator of metal chaos, Slayer Tanya. Beg for mercy and let the chaos begin. Okay, we're, we're live in the pits of Motor and Metal Cast. This is old Dave. I got Eric on the line from Candy Striper Death Orgy. What's up, Eric? What's going on? Not much, man. So when, when did you uh, get this band started, man? Say, oh, say, could you say that again? Said, when, did you, when did you form the band? Oh, oh okay. Uh, late 1988, back um, when I just got out of high school. It started as a different. Um, it started as a different band back in uh, back in high school with a bunch of different people uh, from school, and then it, it morphed into Candy Striper when I got out of high school because I met up with some uh, some people that kind of wanted to do the same music. All wanted to be in the thrash, you know, play thrash. So it morphed into that. We're all getting it. We're all into the thrash as it was coming out at the time, and uh, we all enjoyed Slayer and Nuclear Assault and Overkill and all that stuff, and uh, Megadeth and Testament. And so we we formed Candy Striper. It came out pretty quick and uh, hit the road with it. Well, hit, I shouldn't say hit the road, but hit Boston with it pretty quick, and it got big. So what was the name of the band before Candy Striper Death Orgy? Uh, we went through a bunch of different names when I was in high school. It was Midnight. Uh, there is now a band called Midnight that's big, and they've right. been wrecked on the tour. Um, I, there probably was a bunch of them back in the day, but that's what we called it. Uh, my, my guitar player at the time came up with the name. Um, the other guy jammed with. But when I went to, I got out of high school, went to college, or a two-year college, because I had no idea what I wanted to do. Then I met up with a drummer who was phenomenal, and then we we just kind of pushed it more ahead and formed Candy Striper. Although the name Candy Striper Death Orgy, um, I came up with it with one of the guys I went to high school with. Is there any uh, any meaning behind it? Uh, not really. We were watching a dirty movie one time, <laughs> all hanging out, getting a giggle, called uh, Candy Striper Nurses. So that's kind of how we came up with the name. Uh, cool. So when did you first uh, start playing the guitar? Uh, let's see. Well, I started playing drums in 1977. Moved over to guitar... Uh, I was jamming with everybody in my bass. We're all learning at the same time, all getting into metal, uh, all into the rock stuff. Um, but I was getting more, I was going more with the thrash stuff. The, the guys I was jamming with was more into the glam stuff. They'd leave their equipment over my house, and I'd learn how to play their stuff. So that's how I started playing. That was probably 85, 86. But I didn't get a guitar until probably 87 to jam on and an amp. So... So, you know, right in that time, I learned how to play pretty tight. And I learned how to play the thrash at the same time, right around that time. And, yeah, that's how it began. That's because my guys would leave their stuff over the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Oh, yep. uh, yeah. They went out and partied. I'd stayed back in my house and just learned how to play instruments. You know. So were you self-taught everything, or you took lessons? Uh, self-taught. Never took a lesson. 
So I take it Nuclear Assault's like one of your biggest thrash bands out of all of them. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love Nuclear Assault, love Slayer, love DRI, Overkill, all those bands. Uh, in fact, we've got to tour around with Nuclear Assault a bunch of times uh, since 19... The first time we played them was 1991 on their Out of Order album. I met those guys in 88 in Boston during the holiday thrash bash. Uh, Man of War headlined it, then Nuclear Assault was on just before them, and it was Wargasm, Alliant Rage, and Hades that opened up. And I got to hang out with Glenn, Glenn Evans a little bit, and talk to Danny Loker, and then I started becoming friends with those guys. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we do have a little tinge of their music in us, because that was a big, big influence on us. And of course, you could hear the Slayer in there, and you could hear, you could hear every day of the Judas Priest in our music. Uh, but but it sounds like Candy Striper. Right? We don't rip anybody off. We have our own sound. But people can hear it. You can hear the influences of our stuff. You know, nowadays bands, I, I wish that a lot of these guys would kind of go back to the drawing board because they sound too much like everything else that's out there. you got to find your own sound, and that's tough to do. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I just wish, uh, I don't know, I just, uh, the scene is so different than how it used to be, man. Uh... And 25, 30 years ago, we had a scene, a raging scene, killer bands of all genres. Even, you know, I was not never a big, huge glam guy. I did, like, some of the early Doc and early Molly Crew stuff and early Rat stuff, but um, <clears throat> it was good guitar playing in it, good riffs. But, uh, you know, all, all the scenes back then, there was the, you know, the, the glam scene, the rock scene, the thrash metal scene, punk scene, hardcore scene, death metal scene. They all worked, and they all worked with the clubs, the clubs Nowadays, the clubs and the bands don't work together. The bands get online, they dump on each other. And I wish they would, everybody would just work there a little bit more. And, you know, we get the scene happening a lot better. And you get these younger kids today, they're like, yeah, we got a scene. I'm like, no, you don't. You get 25, 30 people go to a show. It's not a scene. You got to build it. No, but people just want to sit on the internet and uh, and push their stuff. But you got to get out there with the flyers still, you know, and uh, and talk about it more and get it going. I mean, some of these younger bands are doing it pretty well. There's a couple bands in the area that are doing, doing stuff pretty well. But uh, it's a big difference from years ago, man. I wish, I wish the years ago seemed to come back to today. <laughs> yeah, man. I hear you. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, we're on the same age. So have you, have you guys played any shows recently? Uh, let's see. Not recently, recently. Uh, probably the last show... I, I think, wait a second, I gotta think about this for a second. The last show we played was the end of March over in Manchester at this place called Club Jewel. Great place. Uh, been trying to get there for a while. It's under new management. We got in there, put a pretty decent show. Um, the show, unfortunately, was this this battle thing going on, and we, we kind of headlined it. Uh, all the bands during the day, uh, you know, they did their thing and they left. You know, and, and if they even drew any people, they all left. You know, but we brought our own people in and they were a great time that night. I just uh, wish all these bands, like I said, you know, work together and build a scene. But this, it's it's amazing. you got to struggle to really build a scene. But when we do stuff, we do pretty well. We still do pretty well, so I can't say there's no scene. But um, <clears throat> I just think the clubs and the, and the uh, promoters and the bands are going to start working together a little bit more. This doesn't happen too much. But yeah, decent show, man. Before that, where else did we play? Uh, Buddy's Club of Mine of Plows down in Hampshire. Uh, we got something booked for July 8th down in uh, New Jersey at Dingbats. We're playing with a carnivore tribute band called Sex and Violence. And Anthony Bramante from Nuclear Assault will be playing guitar with us that night. He's going to come up on stage. We're going to do a few nuke songs. So people are going to go mental. Yeah. We're going to be dragging an older crowd, of course, to the show. And uh, the only other thing I can book so far is uh, the end of September. It's a big bash up in Maine. Um, they got a pretty, they actually got like a pretty decent scene up there. It's like it's, uh, it's like you almost go back in time when you go up there. That's how the scene is. They kind of keep themselves up there. They don't really go anyplace. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the people don't really leave Maine. They just wait for the bands to come up there. I mean, yeah, I go all over the place to check out bands. But uh, yeah, that's what we got at Stone so far. We're working on a few other things right now. <laughs> Everybody's just a little busy. Have you guys ever played any shows at with uh, Blood Feast down in New Jersey? Uh, never played with Blood Feast back in the day, but we did play with them uh, back in what was it, 2011 in Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, <clears throat> decent show was uh, where, what the heck was it? It was at the uh, I the name of the club. Jeez, I can't remember the name of the club now. <laughs> it was an upstairs. Upstairs deal, they have a downstairs and an upstairs. I played upstairs, not bad. Um, the 
promoters could have done a better job. The opening bands doing, didn't do a damn thing. We came all the way down from New Hampshire, but it was a pretty good show. I mean, it was a good amount of people there. Blood Feast killed. There was a couple other bands on the show that were pretty good. But, geez, the bands from the area didn't bring us all. It's amazing. I wish these bands would work more. Can't stress that enough. I need these bands to work more. But, uh, yeah, Blood Feast a killer, man. Uh, uh, they're supposed to be playing back up here in the Worcester area at some point soon. I just, I'm not sure when. I gotta find out and try to go hang out and check them out again. Have you ever, <laughs> have you ever played any shows with Attacker? No, I haven't. I haven't even heard of them. Yeah, I've just... heard of the name, but I don't know what they sound, they sound like. I'll have to check them out. So how, how much uh, ma recorded material you guys got up for all the years you've been together? We've gone through a lot of um, band member changes over the years. Been around for, Jesus Christ, almost 29 years. Uh, there's a lot of demos floating around. Uh, there's one CD floating around from uh, 2009. We signed a deal, a uh, record deal with uh, Scream Chart Records. Unfortunately, there was a lot of ups and downs with the label because of um, distribution and all kinds of bad things happen in the, in the record company, especially when uh, uh, that certain president took office in 2000. 8, 2009, yeah. everything went downhill, there was no money there. So, you know, it's just, uh, the record company kind of folded. They were lucky to get out the Nuclear Assault album, they were lucky to get the Malaya Rage album, and I believe they put out Seven Witches too, and they re-released an album, I think, from Anvil. Uh, but yeah, we got kind of put to the wayside, but we're on the tail end of it, so the album came out finally in 2009, and then it got re-released through Glenn Evans from Nuclear Assault's label, Cinebus Records, in 2014 online. Um, and that's where that really is. Uh, we're supposed to have a full length out to these labels, and just everything was falling apart with the labels and, uh, and the distribution that, um, you know, we kind of got stuck. So, right now I'm trying to get something out myself, or, or ourselves. We're trying to just put it out ourselves, but it's tough. You know, and the money isn't there, and, um, <clears throat> and the, uh, the internet kills a lot of stuff. And then that's a great tool, but yeah, it kills a lot of stuff. It takes the money out of the artist's back pocket. You know, so we're struggling with that. We're trying to work on that now, too. So I'll let you know as soon as uh, we get something going here. <clears throat> yeah, you get some of the bands nowadays, do you do, do those Kickstarters they record? Uh, Kickstarters? Yeah, you know, fun, 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 the fans. Of the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of these bands try and do these GoFundMe things also, and, and you know, to, to go record something and do that, I don't think that's a good idea. You should really keep that for, like, a, you know, something that's, uh, if you have a problem with something, something's falling apart. <laughs> but even just uh, just recording, say, say you go record all this stuff, you got to get a district deal to get it out everywhere. You know, some people say, don't even put it in the store, it's a waste of time. No, it's not a waste of time. you got to get it out there. Just can't have it on the internet. You gotta have it all the way around. You know, you gotta have it in the stores, you gotta have it online, you gotta have it everywhere and make it available to everybody. It's just tough if you don't have the backing. So right now I'm just trying to get the backing. <clears throat> Cause, uh, Cinepus, I'm not sure what's happening totally with that right now. And Screaming Ferret, that's, that's gone. Unfortunately. So we're gonna see what happens. There's another label floating around. It's, um, signed. Uh, some, my friend's band, well, they're not really bands anymore, but they're old demos that we're putting them out, and these, this label's got some pretty big bands on it, so I'm gonna try to hook up with these guys and see what happens, because they showed some interest in us. I don't want to throw the name out there now, because nothing is etched in stone. <clears throat> so do you guys got a pretty, pretty big following out in New Hampshire? Uh, all over the place. Just as long as we're well promoted, people will come. Uh, New Hampshire, Mass, Rhode Island, I mean, all over the New England states, of course, all over the Northeast. As long as that name gets pushed very well when we're playing a venue, I mean, we can't do it all ourselves. And unfortunately, a lot of clubs want you to do it all yourself, which you can't. You know, but when you get with the right people and they start pushing and pushing you, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll pack them in. Um, like, I'm hoping uh, the show we do in Jersey, um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot on our own and Sex and Vows, the, the other band is playing with us. Great, great band. These guys, I mean, they look like Carnivore even, too. I mean, the, the singer Baron, the singer bass player, he looks like Peter Steele, sounds like Peter Steele. <laughs> but uh, he's, they're doing a lot of work to push, and I just hope the club um, pushes so we can get that place packed in down there. There are lots of friends, but I just hope that uh, the club can help us reach those people, too, because we just can't reach them ourselves. You know, so we'll get it packed in down there. <clears throat> and I tell you, if we have the time,
love it. Like to do a tour of the states. I keep getting asked all the time online. If you go to my Facebook or uh, go to Reverb Nation, we get asked all the time. When are you guys gonna come tour the states again? I said, Well, pretty soon. You know, when we can, <clears throat> we'd have to do a John, so we wouldn't be able to do a full tour because everybody's working and can't afford to lose anything. But you know, we get some backing. I'll get out there at some point. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> So what's going on in your neck of the woods over there, man? Not much. Guys, how's the scene? How's the scene over there? It's a pretty good scene, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna come out to that area. I get some family in the Chicago area, and uh, <clears throat> just haven't been out, out in the uh, Midwest in quite a while. And the last time I was out there, we went to uh, Indianapolis to uh, the U.S. Nationals at um, Indianapolis Raceway Park. <clears throat> that was uh, 2010. Was the last time I was out there. <clears throat> so what do, what do you think about promoters that do paper play shows, man? Uh, there's not really a lot of that stuff going on. Pay to play, that's when you get to buy your way onto a bill. Um, like Ozfest. We could have done Ozfest a couple times. If we wanted to go play a 20-minute set on Ozfest on one of the smaller stages, it would have cost us probably about six to eight grand. That's a pay to play show. Now, there are shows, and I've had my hands on some shows before, put them on. <clears throat> Say if I got, like, people asking me over in this area right now to get Demolition Hammer, and I'm not exactly sure what, how much the, the price is right now. They're from New York City. They got back together like a year and a half, two years ago. And they're probably around three, I'm guessing, three three bills, three grand. So what you got to do is you got to get the bands out there selling tickets. <clears throat> and uh, so the bands do the work to sell the tickets, bring the money, bring the people. And, but a lot of these bands are calling it pay to play now. I'm like, guys, that's not pay to play. Pay to play is when you got to pay up front, you got to pay all the money, and then the promoters just don't care about the tickets. You have to pay them. But a lot of these bands today, <clears throat> what they do is um, they can't sell the tickets, so they're, they're buying them. Then they go around saying it's pay to play, and you know it's not pay to play. <laughs> so I think people are getting mixed up a little bit. Yeah. You know, I see that around here a lot. In fact, the last show I put on, I did it myself. Uh, Actually, no, two, two last shows we did. Um, we brought a couple big bands in. That was the last year. I brought a Final Remains. And um, <clears throat> that was actually two years ago now. And then before that, DRI. And I put the show on. We rented out the hall. The DRI and the buddies of mine, Dirty Ryan Imbeciles. I've known them forever. Set up the show. Of course, we had to pay for the PA system, pay for them, pay for the hall. So we're talking, you know, two grand. And so I, I get bands on the bill, sell tickets, you know. Only 40 tickets, that's all I had to do was sell 40 tickets, $50 a piece. Uh, some of these bands, you know, start crying about it and, you know, whatever. <clears throat> but the show went on good. A lot of people there, first time. Um, and then the second show I did at that club, I do a lot of remains. And I swear, almost every band on the show bought their tickets. <clears throat> it was terrible. You know, then, then they're all screaming and calling me names and, you know, whatever. But most of those bands aren't even around anymore, so I could kill less. <laughs> it's just, it's terrible. That's how the scenes, that's how the scenes turned. But, I wish you could get everybody working again more, man, like I was saying. Then uh, <clears throat> the shows will be packed in and, uh, you know, we can do a lot more stuff. Yeah, I hear you, man. Now everything's done, you know. Oh, boy. And we're still doing it. Like I said, it's uh, fun. We meet up with some of the right people, meet up with some of the right promoters, some of the right clubs, and then they're still doing it good, the right way, you know. But then you meet up with some of the wrong people and just, uh, you know, you butt heads with everybody. Just different. So different than how it used to be. Yeah. You know. But hey, we all love the music. Thrash metal is all, you know, we love it so much. It just We want to go out there and kill it. So we've been doing it for so long. I'm, geez, I'm 46 now. So, so my drummer is the young one in the band. He's in his uh, his mid thirties, I believe. My bass player, geez, he's in his uh, mid fifties now. He's got a he's got a few years on me. I think he's fifty three, fifty four, <clears throat> and he looks like Ian Hill from Judas Priest. <laughs> <laughs> but still pretty good. In fact, he's in a Priest cover band called The Priest. <laughs> mm. So he does stuff with them. He does stuff with us. He's a good time. You know, he loves to play. Oh boy! <clears throat> so the so song, the nitromethane song. When when did you write that song? That that was written back. Uh, oh my God! When the heck did I write that? Uh, of course, I was at the drag races, and, they, and I just um, the riff actually came from. I was on tour. Well, Candy Stripe was on tour with Nuclear Assault, nineteen ninety four. 
couldn't do much. We did a good, good chunk of the tour. Then my drummer decided to leave the band. He didn't want to be in a band anymore. It was six years at that point. And uh, I think it was his girlfriend, Alan, back at the time, whatever. But So he was out. And I was like, oh, crap. So, well, whatever. So I couldn't finish the rest of the tour. So the other guys left. I stayed on tour with Nuclear Assault as one of the road crew. So I go up there and uh, get up there and sound check everything. I was uh, on John Conley's guitar. I was jamming with Glenn Evans. He was on the drums and started throwing out some riffs. That's how I wrote the the, uh, the riffs to um, two songs, Nitro Methane and World War Three, back in 1994. And uh, <clears throat> the lyrics the lyrics to Nitro Methane came probably about 98 when I was in the Wigan Dragway. I was just out there watching uh, some funny cars and drags and some top fuel funny cars and drags going down the track. Then the lyrics started popping in my head. I went home, pieced a song together, and boom, I had a great song. And it still sticks to today. A lot of drag racers like the song. Um, a lot of the guys in IHRA and NHRA on that CD from a while back with Nitro Methane on it. I think I even gave one to Ron Caps with the um, with the uh, Napa Auto Funny Car. Because I know his brother John Caps very well. <clears throat> and he, he's got our stuff, and he's got some of our T-shirts and everything. He uh, he actually drives Nostalgia Nitro Funny Cars. <clears throat> But uh, his brother Ron's pretty cool, but his brother's kind of tough to talk to because he's in the spotlight. You see that all the time when you watch any jury drag race. And so, but he likes his stuff. He digs it. And there's a lot of other names out there that have our stuff, which is cool. I'm, I'm glad. You know, they see the band name, and they go, what the hell? And they want to grab the CD. And they go, oh, Nitro Methane. Cool. Yeah, give me the CD. <laughs> then all of a sudden, all these big drag racer names to listen to the stuff. Here's one for you. Deadliest Catch. The TV show Deadliest Catch. Uh, what's his name? Jonathan, um, oh, what the heck is his last name? One of the guys who runs the boats on there. We did a meet and greet with him at the Bayside Expo Center during the World of Wheels several years ago. Uh, we were talking to him, found out I was in a heavy metal band, started talking to me about the band more, loved the band name, wanted one of my CDs, had to run out to the car and get one, and I signed it for him and gave it to him. And so, from what I hear, he played it on the boat when they were filming, uh, Deadly Sketch in one of the episodes a while back. I wish I could have gotten a, you know, a, a, a tape of that or something. But that's what I heard. That's what I heard. I'm unsure if it really happened or not, but that would be cool if it happened. Yeah, definitely. Jeez, that's a big thing. Hillstrand, that's what his name is. Jonathan Hillstrand. Yeah. <clears throat> He's a drag racer himself. He drag races up in Oregon or Washington uh, State. And I think Alaska, too. <clears throat> So that's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So Candy Striper, all my guys in the band, they're all not really drag racing nuts like I am, but they've been exposed to it and they, they like all the stuff. I'm the guy who's a nut. Can't get enough of it. So how about we take a break and play Nitro Methane for the people out there? Sure. Sure, right. throw it on. All right.
We're back live on the air with Candy Striper Death Orgy. That was nitromethane. Hope you got people liked it out there. Oh, I'm sure they did. Old school thrash metal. <laughs> so you had all lyrics for the band? Um, well, yeah, I some of the lyrics were written, some of the songs we played were written a long time ago. I've had a few other people in the band over the years, and they helped write some of the lyrics, and I'm still singing some of those lyrics, but, but most of the stuff I wrote, and most of the, most of the songs, meaning the guitarists and the music I wrote, too, uh, there are some of the songs from a while back that we play, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> um, from over the years that, that um, uh, other band, uh, other band people that have had a band help write the songs or wrote the songs, and we still play them. And um, in fact, there's some songs with more than half the songs written by somebody else, but they don't care that we're still doing it, so it's cool. I'm glad because we all kind of did it as a band. We, you know, somebody introduced the song, and then we all kind of work on it together. And you know, and you know, so I don't get any gripe from anybody. We can still play the stuff; it's just good. We don't have any hard feelings with anybody. You know, they used to be in the band from years ago. We all talk, which is cool. I'm glad. In fact, uh, one of my old bandmates uh, from high school, Dana, he used to be in Midnight uh, when we first started Candy Striper. Got in touch with me the other day. I haven't talked to him in 30 years. Wild. Mm-hmm. He sent me some old pictures from back then, and we started talking again. Great. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. It's been a long time. He says, oh, my God. He says, I can't believe you're still doing it. Yep, still doing it, man. But he moved down south, so I... Uh, had a chance to see him. <clears throat> now, since you've been doing this since uh, 1988, what what do you think of the pros and cons of the music business? Uh, well, <laughs> well, I get a lot to say about that, but uh, it didn't take too long. Um, we came in the tail end of that uh, whole thrash movement. Uh, if we started out maybe two years earlier, we probably would have been torn like crazy. Probably could have done really great. Um, but we came in on the tail end of it, and we weren't from Boston, we're from New Hampshire. You know, there's a lot of bands that came from New Hampshire originally, like Aerosmith came from New Hampshire, but they got a couple mass guys in there, and they said they were from Boston, that's kind of how they get big. Um, <clears throat> we, on the other hand, like to say we're from New Hampshire, because uh, I was born and bred here. I, I was born in Portsmouth, New Hampshire in 1970, and I just like saying we're from New Hampshire, you know. But uh, that, that kind of hindered us over the years, too a little bit, but I think it was just because we were on the tail end of the scene, and then things were starting to change into the 90s, all that big, that alternative movement happened, and the thrash metal got pulled, pushed to the side for a little bit, the death metal, even the hardcore got pushed to the side, and that stuff became big. And some of those labels that had all the thrash bands and all the other metal bands on it were, were dumping some of their bands to, to sign all these Nirvana wannabes and and Pearl Jam and Soundgarden wannabes. <clears throat> So the scene kind of hindered for a while. A lot of these bands went underground or lost their deals. Um, then they started to come back in the late 90s, early 2000s, some of these bands. And in fact, Nuclear Assault got back together in 2002 uh, fully. I did a couple of shows with them throughout the 90s, which was great. Uh, I got them back together in 97. And in 98, we did a couple of shows. Danny Lilker couldn't do it, so I filled in on bass. So I played with Candy Striper. And did a couple of shows with the Nuclear Assault on Base, too. So we get into the 2000s. You know, they get back together. A lot of bands get back together. Exodus get back together. Overkill was going on strong throughout all those years. They struggled through the 90s. Slayer and Sue was going strong, even though they struggled throughout the 90s a little bit, too. I think it was bands like Pantera that came out and kind of held those thrash bands together because they were hard and heavy. And uh, <clears throat> they kind of helped a lot, a lot of stuff along, which was great. And so the scene kind of continued. <clears throat> now you guys, are, you guys are self-managed, right? Yeah, yeah. I just I do all the stuff. I talk to everybody. I, I set up the shows, and if anybody wants to do anything, they talk to me. We we did some manager stuff a while back, but we're not like uh, if we could devote a lot more time, we'd probably have to do that. Which I'd love to do, but just right now we're gonna we all gonna hold on to our jobs. It's just normal life stuff. You get take care of the bills. Because unfortunately, the bands and the, the you know the music business is going to pay for it. Uh, yeah, the music business is so up and down. Um, it's like you got to if you want to do anything really, <clears throat> if you want to try to really make a lot of money with this, you basically got to sign your soul to the devil 
so to speak. Like, I don't know if you ever heard that, but that's been like a saying for years. Mm-hmm. And you got to kind of do what they want you to do and not play the music you want to play. You know, but we're all into what we like to do. And, you know, that's why we're still doing it. <clears throat> now, is, is social media important to you guys? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I use it. I throw it out there. Um, but the problem is, uh, you know, a lot of bands these days, they just rely on social media and that's it. Um, you can't do that. You gotta get out there. You gotta do some legwork. You gotta, you gotta go to shows. I still tell younger bands now that I like. They, you know, they ask me for advice and I, I don't help out too many people because, I don't know, just, you, you tell them what to do and then they get pissed off at you and they, they want to just dump all over you or whatever and, and do it online and stuff to people. Uh, because uh, they don't want to do something that you told them to do, and they're asking you what to do to keep going. But some of these bands, I help out, and I, and I, and, um, and I tell them, well, this is, guys, this is what you got to do. You got to make up some flyers, get your band name out there, go hand them out of shows, put your website on it, put an address, put a f- contact phone number, make the flyer look good so it attracts attention. I said, you give somebody just a website, they're not going to remember it. They'll look at it, and they're going to delete it. They're not going to care so much. But if you got this flyer you're going to give to them with the website or the MySpace or the, I mean, well, whatever, the Facebook on it, you know, and you got all that on there, it's a good looking flyer. These people most likely are going to hold on to that flyer and they're going to look at it when they go home. So that's how you're going to keep yourself going. In fact, I haven't done that in a while. I'm going to hit up some new people myself at these next few shows we're going to go to throughout the summer. So uh, that's the best way to promote yourself when you go to shows <clears throat> and to help yourself out to get the word out on you so people will actually look at your social media to start talking about you to push you because it's hard just to go out there and just do a social media thing you know just do it all social media you gotta you gotta do the old school work too with it to make it work right <clears throat> exactly yeah yeah it's a lot of hard work just for us just doing some shows uh, you know go out there and bust bust ass just trying to get the word out. Do a lot of social media and try to put flyers in places where people are going to grab them. And uh, you try to talk to some store owners, put them up in some certain areas where you're going to be. And you try to get them to the clubs and hopefully the clubs are going to put them up. Because half the time, they don't even put them up. <laughs> you know? And so you give them to them, they oh yeah, we'll put them up. And you find out they're going to put them up. They're like, oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wish a couple things would change with the scene and the business. But yeah, as soon as, as soon as the internet got big and the, the social media took over, the record labels were losing some of their pull because now you get people going online stealing music. You know, the whole thing about uh, Lars coming out from Metallica years ago with Napster, he was right. You know, at first, they you know, think he's, they sound like a crybaby about it, but no, he was right. Uh, that's why Metallica was able to get a hold of all their music and own all their music. And now they, they can actually make money off the music through downloads and everything. It's hard to own your own music if you if you if you get signed because uh, some of these labels end up taking over your music, and then you get no say in the matter, and that's that's terrible. Uh, Glenn from Nucleus All just went through that uh, with Sony, so you know I struggled with that for a while. I don't want to get into that because I uh, shouldn't probably talk about all those details, but um, yeah, it's a struggle, man. You, you gotta watch what you do when you get out there. And to really want to, if you really want to just, um, uh, how can I put this, uh, not even make it huge, just get out there and do what we're doing. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. So let, let yeah. me let me ask you this, Eric. What was the first concert you ever attended when you were young? First concert? Let's see. I think, uh, I think it was the Kingston, New Hampshire Fairgrounds. I think it was the Joe Perry Project. Joe Perry from Aerosmith. He left Aerosmith, uh, was 1980, I believe, 79, 80, and started the Joe Perry Project, the three records. My parents brought me out there. I think it was my mom. Yeah, my mom brought us out. My dad didn't go. I think I was 11 or 12. No, it was 1982, I think. I think it was uh, around 12. It was them, John Butcher Axis, and I think it was Thrust. First concert I ever attended. Yeah, very cool. And right around that time, we saw a couple other acts over there. And then, then the big show was, the uh, first big show I ever went to was Kiss. In, uh, no, wait, Joe Perry was in 81, Kiss was 82. My parents brought us to see Kiss, Creatures of the Night Tour. And then the other big show we had to go see was Defenders of the Faith, Judas Priest, 1984. And then I just, uh, from there, just continued. 
you know, saw Priest every time they came around, and uh, saw a couple other bands, and and then when I was old enough to get out there and do it myself, I started going to clubs all the time. <laughs> and that's how I spread the word about Candy Striper, and that's kind of how we how we got into the scene pretty quick, and how we got kind of big right off the bat. Now, what what age did you get into drag racing? Uh, well, I started going to, going to the drag races with my father back in, I think it was 75, doing a dragway, and I just can't get enough of it. It's in my DNA. I just love it just as much as I love metal. It, it almost kind of gives you that same feel. And um, I don't know, I just love the things so much that I kind of mixed them together. In, in, back in the 90s, I met up with this team called Hellraiser out of uh, Tewksbury, Massachusetts, John Donato, and um, got talking to him. He was pretty cool. Uh, he just seemed like a cool guy that liked everything. He's into Harleys, drag racing. You know, maybe not the music that we're playing or we're into, but he liked the heavy stuff. But he thought the name was kind of cool, the name of our band. So he put the name of the band on his car. And boy, it took off. <laughs> People started talking about it everywhere. Now, he had an alcohol, top alcohol funny car. He ran a lot of these uh, match races in the Wingham Dragway and Lebanon Valley Dragway in upstate New York. This car didn't run on nitro, it ran on alcohol, but it, it attracted so much attention. But then we went up to some other races uh, over the years, get our logos put on their cars. Uh, top fuel team out of uh, Galveston, Texas, Mitch King. He, re- he raced the IHRA circuit, part of the NHRA circuit. Our uh, band logo made on TV. Uh, where else did we get on? We get on uh, the Bartones uh, from New York City, his drags, the Michael Bartones. Uh, top alcohol drags a while back. We got to a couple other funny cars, and it just kind of mixed. Everybody kind of knows me with the racing and the, and the band now, so it's kind of cool. And several times, I just happened to be at the races, made on TV several times with the band shirt on, and everybody just talks about it, talks about it now. In fact, they call me Nitro Rick sometimes instead of Eric or Rick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even with the bands, you know, my, we're doing a show someplace, hey, it's Nitro Rick, because they see the drag racing. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I love that stuff so much. In fact, uh, can't wait till next time I go to the races. <laughs> yeah, you can't okay. be, you can't beat the smell of nitro methane, man. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. You describe it to somebody and, and they got no clue, and it's like guys, it's like gunpowder and bleach mixed together. Get the eyes yeah. burning up. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And when they hit you in the face, the the, the, the air is yellow. Your eyes your, your eyes tear up. Uh, the you, your throat hurts, you know, it's, but it's great. You love it. <laughs> yeah. You see these guys show up at the races, and they go down to the pits, and they, they're, they're wearing their, chem, you know, their chemical gas mask down there. I just walk right into it. They probably can't take it anymore. I'm gasping for air and get out of it, and they get back into it again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's great when people hit it the first time. They're like, oh, my God, Jesus. My girlfriend, she gets right in there. Brittany, she's awesome. She gets right into it, and she'll stand right there. And the eyes are gushing and everything. <laughs> People are like, wow, she's taking like a champ. She gets high fives when she walks out of the nitro smoke. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, if you, if you never attended a drag race, oh, my God, you got to go. It's totally different from NASCAR. Mm-hmm. And NASCAR, is, it's, it's decent, but it's drag race is more of a rush. It keeps your attention longer. Oh, yeah, and drag racing, you can get to the drivers in the pits. That's the biggest thing. That's why I tell everybody, the NASCAR guys, I'm like, guys, you, you got to go to drags. Because the, the, cause you get in the pitch, you can talk with these people, you get to see them warm up, you get to see them work on their engines, you get to ask them questions. And then when you're on the track watching, there's, there's always, it's always changing. It's not the same 40 cars going around in circles for a while. You know, it's, it, Everything's changing, keeping your attention. And it's cool. And the sound, you know, I tell people, I'm like, man, you got to hear a couple of nitro burning funny cars and drags just take off and go 330 miles an hour down a track. I said, you, you, you never experienced anything until you heard that. Yeah. Even if they go watch Pro Mods, Pro Mods are cool, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I was friends with several Pro Mod teams. They used to come around with the IHRA circuit when uh, New England Drag was part of the IHRA circuit several years ago. In fact, there's a person from Canada, my same last name, Payone. No relation, though. But to hang out with them quite a bit. Even the nitrous pro mods are pretty cool because they shoot flames at night. The nitrous mixes them with the gasoline and they blow flames with the exhaust pipes. Uh, but I always like the alcohol burners better because it's louder. Plus, it's a blown motor. Blown motor's just cool. So, yeah, I used to hang with those guys. I'm hoping to see more pro mods show up in doing a dragway this year. <laughs> see what happens. 
Yeah, we got a big group over here called the Chicago Wise Guys. They got everything in the group, Pro Mods, Blown Alcohol, Natural, yeah. natural Aspirated, everything's in the group. Uh, yeah, yeah, I looked into that before. I remember seeing that online. Yeah, I'd like to come out there and just come and hang out with the races out there. I'd like to go to, uh, I'd like to go up to Wisconsin, too, and go to uh, Broadway Bob's, one of his shows. Yeah, that's, that guy's a, yeah, that's where I live, close by, like 45 minutes from. Oh, okay, okay. Geez, the last time I was in Wisconsin, we played the big, huge metal festival out there. To so Jack Koshik years ago. Yeah, Milwaukee Metal Fest. Yep. Yeah, yeah it was uh, just before 9-11. It was 2001. We played there with DRI. Uh, who the hell else played? Uh, Danny Looker played in two bands that weekend. Then he had to leave. He had to fly out to California to go play in SOD. It was a big um, thrash bash with Chuck Billy. Because Chuck Billy just got over his cancer. This is back in 2001. It was the original, it was Violence that played, the original Forbidden, when they, they called themselves Forbidden Evil. They played, SOD played, uh, and, and a few other bands played. I can't remember exactly. But yeah, I wish we could have gotten on that, though, for Christ's sake. But no, we played at Milwaukee Metal Fest. It was killer. Killer, killer, killer. Man, those festivals are awesome. They get a fest out here in Worcester every year. It's a Northern Hardcore Death Metal Fest, and it just isn't that great. It's it's too much of the tough guy hardcore stuff, and, or or more than uh, you know, I don't know. I can't, I can't. You know, I don't want to mention band names, but every now and then I'll get a few good bands here. But it's not like the Jack Koshik one shows. We used to do the, his shows in New Jersey, and we did that one out there in Wisconsin. It was awesome. Great bands. Uh, these, these guys from all over the place in Europe would show up selling T-shirts and hard to find stuff. So you always had to make sure you brought about a grand to buy all this merchandise. <laughs> but uh, man, that was so much fun. I wish that was still going on. Yeah, but there's another fest in uh, Milwaukee that comes in like, April. They do it. It's called the NYDM Spring Bash. Oh, oh, okay, okay. I heard about that. There's one they do in uh, Maryland, too, the Maryland Death Fest. Yeah. In fact, we saw it played there. And I was supposed to get out the last time they played, which was several years ago, and I just couldn't make it. I ended up having to work. And then Bolt Thrower was uh, played. They played one time, and I was supposed to go to that, too. But I couldn't make it down. Just other other stuff got in the way, just no money. When you go to a fest like that, all the hotels are taken up in the area, and you're going to stay, like, 40 miles away from the damn place. You know, and you can have a lot of money in your back pocket. And sometimes it's kind of tough. But you got to get your hotel like right away. Oh, they go to those things. But uh, yeah, man, I missed that Wisconsin Metal Fest. I mean, that that was oh my god. And I missed the missed New Jersey Fest because New Jersey would always play with like Nuclear Assault, Overkill, Deicide. It was awesome. Cannibal Corpse. <laughs> man, those shows are killer. Plus, Jack was a great guy. A lot of people are like, oh, Jack's a, you know, this, he's that. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? He always treated us good because we did what we had to do. And we played, and he loved the band. And he, li he liked the Screaming Ferret. We were one of the Screaming Ferret bands at the time. And we all kind of came in together. We were one of the Screaming Ferret bands playing the stages. And we all got treated great. I saw that stuff. I'd like to bring that back again. <laughs> all right, there's another fest in Illinois called the Four Terra Salt. Yeah, I've heard about that one, too. Yeah, yeah. I think Sacred Rex playing this year. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. I did reset about that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So I Sacred Rex years ago. Um, I think it was Sacred Rex, Sepultura, um, Forced Entry. Forced Entry was killing obituary. I believe that was the show. No, wait a second, wait a second. No, 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 no. Wait a second, wrong show. It was Napalm Death. Wait, no, it was it was Sick of It All Open, Napalm Death. Sacred Reich and Sepultura. That was the show. Okay. Yeah, I, I remember that, that tour. The, yeah. the Clash of the... Yeah, wasn't that the that, Clash of the Titans? What was, what was that? 90, 91, something? I, something like that. I, I forgot. I was getting those two shows mixed up. Yeah, what, wasn't it called the Clash of the Titans or something like that? Or New Titans, uh, on, new ti new Titans on the no, Block? No. Yeah, something like that. Something something on the new, something like New Kids on the Block. Or yeah, new, new, yeah, Clash new, of the Titans was Anthrax, Negative, right. and uh, Slayer. Yeah, New Titans on the Block. New Titans on the Block. That's it. Yes, yes. Yep. Yeah, it was killer. That was a killer show. I mean, I was dead after Napalm Death. <laughs> I, couldn't do, I couldn't do anything. I had to go sit around during the sake of Reich. I just I couldn't breathe. I had to go outside for a little bit. And then Supple Turret came on. I started moshing again. <laughs> I still do that. I'm 46 years old. I go run around these shows like a maniac. And I can't breathe. <laughs> I lose some weight. <clears throat> I spring 
chicken anymore. You go to a Slayer show and you start getting all excited again. You start running around. You're like, oh, oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine if you went to the 70,000 tons of metal, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I don't like going on big boats like that. No, my girl's like, hey, let's go on a cruise. I'm like, nah. I don't know. I don't like get on the water like that. But then they see all these killer bands in the plane. Like, wow, that's pretty cool. I'll have to go out there and see that. And then, I don't know. I just got something with big boats like that. Maybe it's I've seen that uh, Poseidon adventure too much. Or I saw, uh, I was on another movie there that came out in the late 90s. It ended up being a love story. Titanic. But, yeah, Titanic, yeah, yeah. I've seen that movie a few times. And there you go. Oh, geez, I don't know if I'm going to go on the boat after seeing that. <laughs> I'm sure you're probably a lot safer for being out on the boat than you are driving, but still. So, who, so, oh, so, these days. so who's your top favorite five bands of a lifetime, man? Top favorite bands? Yeah. Oh, Jesus, that's hard. I'd probably, uh, I'd have to throw Judas Priest in there. Uh, I'd have to throw, like, uh, the regular right, soda in a. As soon as it came out of the womb, my parents were listening to Led Zeppelin. So there's two of them. Slayer, Nuclear Assault. This one's gonna be tough. You know, people would be yelling Black Sabbath, but I, I wouldn't put Black Sabbath in there. Not in the four, not in the five bands. Maybe the ten bands, especially with Ronnie James Dio. But I'd probably say, ah, oh, jeez, that's a tough one. Carnivore slash typo negative. Cool. And that might be tied with DRI. Get us with DRI. There. That's a tough. That's a tough squeeze. Tied with them for fifth. Yeah. I did something about Peter Steele and his music. I always loved Carnivore. They were a big influence on me. Then when he started doing the type of negative stuff, I dug it. And then, of course, it got, you know, it, it changed. It didn't sound like Carnivore anymore. But if any other band did that music with the keyboards, I probably wouldn't have liked it. But it was, it was type of negative Peter Steele, and I just really get into it. And I miss, miss him. I, we got to hang out with him several times, played with type of negative a few times years ago. I uh, got a chance to see Carnivore come around and, 95, I believe it was, in upstate New York, and was it brutal? Wow. Original Carnivore lineup. Well, not the original, but the, the Retaliation lineup, uh, the second album. So, yeah, I'd say those are probably my five. It's, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough to pick. So where do you see your band five to ten years from, though? Uh, unfortunately, probably doing the same thing we're doing now. <laughs> 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 I'm just being honest. I'd like to be, uh, I'd like to just have us put all of our jobs aside and just go do a big tour because we, we get asked to do this stuff sometimes and it's tough. It's really tough because we all need to work and, uh, and you gotta, you got to pay your bills and keep everything going. And if you go take off on a tour for a month or two or three or four, you come back to nothing. You know, then you can start over again. You're not going to make the same money you're making and then you lose out because you're not going to really make any money touring. You know, I mean, you might be able to make enough money just to pay some bills, but then you come back, you got nothing. So uh, it's tough. It's tough. I don't know. But, you know, we're still going to just keep plugging away and having a good time. That's cool. You know? So where do, where can people find you guys, like websites, stuff like that? To, uh, okay. Uh, well, I do have a website, but it, the website hasn't been updated in a while. It's just csdo.net or csdo.com. It goes to the same website. You can see all the old pictures, and I get a bunch of old pictures, so it's worth going there. Of course, we're on uh, Facebook, just... CSDO Thrash on Facebook. Uh, there's still MySpace there, but I haven't played around with it in a while. There is, there's some killer photos over there. They just type in Candy Sharp and Death Energy on the MySpace. And of course, there's a Reverb Nation too. Where even when you're at Reverb Nation, just type in Candy Sharp and Death Energy. You get to see some cool stuff. But we mostly do everything on Facebook and Reverb Nation. Yes. And I've talked to Twitter a few times, and I don't really use that. Just mostly Facebook and, and Reverb Nation. It's easy. That's In cool. Fact, I wish uh, I wish MySpace was the way it was years ago because that was easier to work to push your bands on. on. It just worked better for bands, but they changed it all around and things got messed up, and so it's, it's hard to know anything on there anymore. But it's still there for people to look at it. So do you have any final words for all the fans out there, man? Uh, let's see. Well, I don't know. That's... I don't know. Can't take anything. <laughs> um, well, if you're the band um, and you're starting out, you got to really work at this stuff, man, and really ask yourself, is this really, if, do you want to do this for fun? Do you really want to try and do something with this? Because it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of money out of your back pocket. 
takes a lot of time. It's just not all partying. Uh, you know, some people get into this thing, they just think of, you know, getting drunk, getting chicks, playing killer music, but it doesn't work like that. You gotta become a businessman and you gotta, uh, you gotta really push yourself. You gotta sell yourself out there. And then you gotta, uh, expect to, you know, uh, be attacked by people sometimes want autographs and everything. I'll be someplace that I've been in a long time and all of a sudden just a bunch of metalheads will come out of nowhere and go, hey, that's Eric from Candy Striper. I mean, still get that. And we're not, we're not touring like crazy all over the place like a lot of these other bands. And then, you know, you gotta take the time and make sure you talk to everybody. And, uh, you know, sign whatever. Because uh, we still, uh, we still get that after all these years. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be in a supermarket someplace that you don't normally go to and all of a sudden you get bombarded by three or four people jumping on you then you go on the parking lot there's another person because I stand out so I, I kind of get it a lot I'll be at the races and somebody's taking a picture in the crowd boom you can see my <laughs> you can see my head you can see my hair my face and everything I stick out in the crowd so it's these people find you out there so you gotta be you know, you gotta expect to uh, uh, deal with people a lot when you get out there I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think that's really about it. It's just going to work hard when you, when you do this stuff. And try and sound like you're...